Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money in Investing show. This week we are in the subject of stock analysis. Typically you'd expect this to be pretty dry, talking about PEs and technicals, but we're gonna go off piece a little bit with this one and do a deep dive on one of Australia's uh, most famous, or should I say infamous companies right now, and see what's gone well, or perhaps more importantly, what hasn't and why. Look forward to seeing you in the show. Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing show with me, your host, Andrew Baxter, and as always, my offsider and co-host, Mitchell Laurential. Thanks for having me on the show, Mr. B. Bread and butter today, although we're going to put a bit of a different spin on things. Be prepared to be put on the spot. Hope you've got your stats ready. We're going to talk about stock analysis, but not usually in the traditional way that most would think of. We're going to involve the pub test, the PE ratio, the technicals, and everything that goes alongside it. Lots of different ways of carving up the cake. And I think um, in this day and age where markets were overanalyzed by, by so many people, you know, be that looking at the charts and, uh, and slicing and dicing and, and taking your trades, whether it's digging into the financial accounts and coming up with the ratios, looking at ESG scores, which is a, a hugely important factor in today's world, of course. But I think sometimes it just boils down to the pub test. And as my father would often say, common sense is not so common. And we'll see how we go with this as we go through. I'll, I'll try and stay in lane. I'm sure you've got a big stick there Ooh, to yeah. keep there. That's right. Never a true word spoken. I love that from your dad. Let's start off. And you know, probably the best way to actually run this episode might be with a specific example. And I'm going to pick one that's in the headline at the moment, and that's Qantas. Mm. They've just been sued by the ACCC for selling somewhere in the order of 8,000 ghost flights. Mm. Good time to be talking about this stock because not all is what it seems when you look below the surface. Absolutely. Look, I mean, it's been a massive headline grabber uh, for pretty much all the wrong reasons for quite a period of time. Uh, and I want to be really clear before we dive into this. Uh, as a pretty frequent flyer uh, myself, and I do fly a lot with Qantas, I just want to put a big shout out to the Qantas crew, both on the ground and in the air, because as, as individuals, they bend over backward to accommodate passengers, passenger requests, uh, and make the experience as pleasurable it can be. Uh, and I've only got good things to say about my interaction with their frontline staff. I think as we dive a little bit deeper, what we might expose is the uh, policies, procedures, and decisions that have been thrust upon those frontline staff that are the face of the business uh, for management and indeed from an executive level, which have left them in a, a more challenged position where they bear the wrath of the customer that's yelling because the flight's canceled, which didn't even exist anyway. And it's not their problem. It's a problem that's been created by, as I say, management and exec. So again, huge shout out to the Qantas uh, staff that we have dealing with. We've got Qantas clients, uh, the Qantas staff that are clients too. So big shout yep. out to those guys. Couldn't agree more. Let's keep this Let's keep this simple to begin with at least. And let's talk about stock performance. And typically the metric we use for this is benchmarking. So that's when you compare a stock price <laughs> relative to the index to see where your money would yeah. be better placed. In the case of Qantas, if we just kind of earmark this. Uh, don't get me started. I've, 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 I've had my history with AMP. Oh yeah. Let, let's get started in one word, rubbish. Okay, so we go. earmarking this, let's take 2007 because I believe there was a buyout offer, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. I mean, 2007 was prior to the GFC. Uh, yeah, at the time we'd been involved with listing companies like Babcock and Brown and we were doing some work with Phil Green there and also a gentleman called David Coe who, who, who would be one of the sharper brains, I think, in the finance uh, space and in, in, in particularly in infrastructure finance. Uh, and David Coe's business, Elco, they actually went under, um, made an offer of up to $5.45 per share for Qantas way back in 2007. Uh, you know, and you consider the Qantas share price at the moment is, uh, as we're recording this today, $5.64. Um, you know, there's been an awful lot of water under the bridge uh, during that time. Interestingly enough, I think at the time the Qantas board supported the offer and takeover from from Elka, um, and the shareholders didn't, citing that they didn't feel it was sufficient value for the business. But I guess here we are, what's that, 2007 to today, 16 years later, uh, and we've got a share price that's really done diddly squat during that time. In fact, you know, you talk about benchmarking, um, you know, if we look at the, the, the index over that period of time, the index is up over 28%. And that's the, just for our listeners, the benefit of that, that's the overall ASX 200, Correct. right, the index. Yeah, so the ASX uh, 200 uh, used to be known, well, uh, more formally, informally as the um, uh, the All Ordinaries Index, uh, but the ASX 200 is a benchmark here in Australia, S&P uh, ASX 200. Uh, yeah, over over 20% over that same time frame. So you've got a stock that's delivered uh, around about an 8% gain to give it its credibility, uh, and yet you've got an index that's there. So it's, it's significantly underperformed, and I guess 
guess, you know, given Alan Joyce uh, departing or departed, uh, should I say, shouldn't speak ill of the dead, uh, CEO, um, let's look specifically during his reign at the helm, having been the savior of the business, the person that turned it around uh, and received in excess of $120 million uh, in remuneration for his time it's in doing that. It's isn't it? Big number. Over 10 years, right? Over a 10 year time frame. It's not bad. Um, and, 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 uh, you know, and if you look at CEO pay, if a CEO has delivered absolute value for the stakeholders, and the stakeholders are primarily the shareholders, obviously, which I think, as, as we're about to explore, has not been the case. And then look at the other stakeholders being your customers or indeed your staff. It's, it's a very interesting predicament that Qantas now find themselves in, which is why they're having to you know, really work pretty hard in terms of crisis management on defending their brand. So if we look at the the, the, the time under the Joyce uh, leadership, so Qantas's share price, including dividends, let's let's include the dividends, so it's a total return to investors, uh, was 8.1%. Uh, since he took over. Since, since takeover. And if okay. you compare that to uh, what the index has done, including dividends, is around about 9.2% over the same time frame. So during that time frame under the Joyce uh, wing, so to speak, it's underperformed the market. And that's according to the AFR. I did read that article myself. Yeah, so that's that's from the AFR. So they've got no axe to grind. You can verify those numbers um, specifically. Um, you know, if you look at the pricing chart. So you know, on an absolute basis, it's it's not been especially attractive. And as you say, yeah, you know, when you you consider, you know, back in two thousand and seven, you know, five dollars forty five. Uh, you could have cashed out of your shares, which was an attractive offer at the time, but rejected by shareholders. If you'd have then taken taken your dough uh, and plugged it into some of the other companies listed on the ASX, whether that be some of the banks or it, particularly in the mining sector, how many times fold you would have been able to increase your overall wealth by doing that, which highlights, of course, the, the importance of being an active investor and not just sitting with a share in your portfolio for the long term, hoping over time uh, it continues to grind higher. So yeah, on an absolute basis, price-wise, yeah, it's not been good. Stock performance, fail. We can rule that criteria out pretty quickly. Let's chat about profitability. Now, from my understanding, Qantas has had a fair bit of help from the government, from the public sector. Yeah, and, and, and again, you know, our job is not to create the rule book in any way, shape or form, then it's Qantas's job to create the rule book. Rule book. You just play to, to, to what's put in front of you. Uh, and if we look over the course of the pandemic, for example, um, you know, Qantas took, I think, $2.7 in taxpayer um, subsidy uh, to help his business. Also, um, you know, push pretty hard for that. Uh, being, a big number. being the Australian carrier, uh, and you could argue that okay, there, there was no obligation to pay that back. Our current treasurer, Jim Chalmers, has made it abundantly clear that it didn't come uh, with an obligation to pay it back. Although I think you know, without being too partisan, it'd be fair to say that you know the Labor Party have been shown recently with some of the rumours and stories going around to be. Uh, a little closer than is healthy uh, with with Qantas, of course. Um, the- oh, just to pause there, though, Abby, just being subsidised during that COVID period, as mm. you made mention of, there are other companies which I know had plenty of subsidy, Absolutely. Harvey Norman, JB Hi-Fi, yeah, well, they, 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 that, that's right. And this is where it comes down to the pub test. And I guess, you know, we're traders and, and we look at financial markets and we've got all these whiz-bang techniques, strategies and, and IP that we bring to analysis. But at the end of the day, plain old pub test, Common sense, every person's view. So you've got a company that's just banked around 2.7 billion uh, in profit uh, for this year, which is a terrific profit. And we all love to see companies um, deliver a great return for their investors. That's why we're in this gig. And yes, they borrowed, or sorry, they were given 2.7 billion by coincidence also from the Aussie taxpayer with no obligation to pay it back. Yet there are other companies uh, that, that received subsidy during the pandemic that also didn't have an obligation to pay it back, but chose to. And their companies had also profited massively in the fallout from the pandemic. Harvey Norman will be one example of that and probably JB Hi-Fi, yep. I know they're similar businesses. Uh, and so there's two companies that have gone, look, we don't have to pay this back either, but we're doing pretty well. So we don't really need the money. We've banked some great profits. So how about we help the Aussie taxpayer and and pay some back. And you might argue if you're cynical that that's window dressing and it's just optics. Well, if it is window dressing and it is optics, the big beneficiary of it's been the Australian taxpayer, you, me, and everyone else listening to uh, this podcast. And that's a good outcome. And it's rather like when people pen someone wealthy for donating to charity, they go, they're just doing it for the tax break, but they didn't have to make the donation in the first place. So be seeing the good in it as opposed to the cynical side. And Qantas, I think, has been in a, a very good position where it would have garnered significantly less reputational damage 
uh, than it has if it had made some effort and him wrote in saying, look, thanks for helping us through the pandemic. We've come out the other side, business is good. We don't have to, but we'd like to, we'd like to chip a bit back into the coffer of the Australian taxpayer. And that's the sort of thing from a pub test perspective uh, and from a brand integrity perspective, creates a brilliant optic and uh, and I think would have gone a long way to putting things in a very different frame right now. So, you know, I think that that, that whole notion um, of, uh, of how they've played that has been quite poor. And ultimately that comes down to the way the business is being handled at a corporate and board level as to what value you put on the strength of your brand compared to what value you place on the bottom line. So question to you then, AB, if we work under the header of profitability for a moment's time, 2.7 billion, not a bad outcome. A lot of that has been debt reduction, which now there's yeah. debt sits at about 1.9 billion. Yep. Any particular reason yeah, for that? There is. Um, again, you know, the Corners Board have done a lap of honor going, look, we've been able to reduce debt, which is a good thing for the business. And then we're like, well, that, that, that's fantastic. That's a, a stronger balance sheet. That's, that's an enhancement to the business. But right at the start of the broadcast, we talked about the various stakeholders uh, in that business. And it's not just about shareholders, it's also about customers, and it's also about you know, the value of the brand in itself. Uh, and if you look very specifically at what Qantas has done, the age of its fleet, uh, and as I say, I fly a lot, uh, not as much as I used to, uh, but enough to, to, to observe this and, and see, and I'm very picky now as to who I travel with uh, for, for on, a, on a few different metrics. So if we go back to 2006-07, uh, pre-GFC, around the time of the David COVID, the, 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 age, the average age of an aircraft in the Qantas fleet was about eight years, okay. eight years old. That's about standard, which right? Which is standard for the leading airlines of the world. Any examples in that space yeah, you can so give us? If you think about, and actually I think the Financial Review and I think the Australian just published quite recently their table of who, who the best carriers are. Uh, and that's a combination of service, uh, it's a combination of fleet, it's a combination of pricing and, and other value add that goes alongside across the, the, the different categories, economy, business first and so on. Um, and about eight years is, is, is about what's expected for a top tier Airline, and in fact, if you if you look at Singapore Airlines, their average age of their fleet is about six years. If you look at Emirates, it's about nine and a half years, give or take. If you look at Qatar, not that we're seeing much of Qatar, and we'll get on to why we're not seeing them in a few moments, the average age of their fleet is around five years. Now, Qantas's fleet since 2007, they haven't bought many planes. You wonder why the debt on the balance sheet has been reduced. Uh, is because they haven't updated their fleet. So the average age of the Qantas fleet right now is 14.7 years, which is actually pretty damned old. Uh, in, in terms of top tier airlines, it's non-existent that top tier airlines have fleet that old. Uh, you might see it, uh, for example, if you look, I think I could be wrong on this, but I think United in the US is about 15. Uh, I could be wrong on that, but one of the American uh, airlines is, is, is significantly older, and that's very obvious when you travel over in the US. So there's where the debt reduction has come from. So imagine saying, look, we're not gonna spend anything to reduce our debt, but we're going to end up with a significantly older fleet. And this is going to be a real problem for the new management team as they come through, because uh, their challenge is going to be, well, if we want to reposition ourselves as a top tier airline, one of the things that we have to do um, is to update our fleet, which is going to involve extreme capital expenditure, which is likely to increase the debt on the balance sheet again. So yes, the debt on the balance sheet has been reduced, but has it been reduced in an optimal way? Well, it depends on the optic that you're looking for. If you want a, a strong looking balance sheet, which may help facilitate executive remuneration, it probably worked. But in terms of having an older fleet, and, and bear in mind, of course, you know, Qantas's catch cry amongst other things has been, yeah, you know, we've never lost an aircraft. Well, your fleet's getting a bit older and touch wood, as someone that flies a lot, I hope that never happens. But you know, it's time for an update there and that will massively damage the balance sheet in terms of the debt reduction that's gone on, will then start to go up. Maybe they can help that by reducing some of the executive remuneration. You mentioned that just prior. So I think it's Richard Goiter, who's the chairman of the Qantas board. Correct. He's got a big job because a big paycheck like 120 million over 10 years, can that really continue? Yeah. It, it, it's a really interesting one. And Richard Goiter um, has been a CEO that yeah, I've, I've, I've admired from afar for an awful long time. I think particularly during his time at West Farmers, I would argue that he's one of the best CEOs in Australia. And, and he was with West Farmers for an awful long time. Interestingly enough, West Farmers is a bigger company than Qantas, yet his remuneration during the time when he was CEO of West Farmers 
uh, is a fraction of that that was paid to Alan Joyce, just, just, a, just as a, a, yeah. a, a snippet. So Richard Gordy's job now is, and there's been some call in there that he should resign too, and I don't know that that's the answer because he's got the ability through his experience and standing uh, and expertise, I think, to right the ship uh, from a stewardship point of view from the chairman's seat uh, and chairman of the board. But he does have some very difficult decisions, and that may be that you know, the severance package for the outgoing CEO is is, is reduced quite considerably. And look, it's uh, the, the, there are other metrics within the business and there's also some impending liability that's come from the conduct of Qantas over the last number of months uh, that, that, that are a contingent liability that run into the hundreds of millions. And, and, and you know, branding is such an important thing for a big company. And I, I mentioned, you know, with the likes of Harvey Norman and JB Hi-Fi, um, the optic of paying JobKeep, oh, yeah, they only paid it back because it looks good. But they didn't have to do it. It's, so it's a, a good thing you do, right? And, and so they chose to, and yes, it may put their brand in a better light. And I think that reflects the respect that those companies place on their brand. And I think potentially for Qantas, and again, you know, I can't state it enough, for their frontline staff, I really do feel for them because they are being undermined by what's in the background. They put a brave face on, they patch over the cracks in the wallpaper, they do a terrific job where they can of enhancing the customer experience. But the damage to the brand, potentially as the spirit of Australia, which is their marketing slogan, if that's the spirit of Australia, we've got something pretty damn wrong with our country right now. Let's just call it what it is. Because the customer service has dropped away through cost cutting and offshoring uh, of call centers, uh, through the reputational damage through the ACCC action that's afoot at the moment where the Qantas have sold tickets for flights that they already knew were cancelled. Now, that's Makes unconscionable. So someone in good faith, and I've done this myself, has booked an airfare going, great, that's the flight time I need. Yep. That gets me to where I need to for a wedding, a funeral, a business meeting, a social gathering, whatever it might be. And I've booked that ticket in good faith. And as I've booked it, I've paid you my money, which I'm obligated to do. And then at two in the morning, you get the notorious text message. I had one of these recently coming back from uh, somewhere in Australia just recently. <laughs> that. That your flight's been cancelled, but it's okay. We've got you on another flight. Well, I should bloody hope so. But... The inconvenience is worth a lot. The reason I booked the time of the flight I did is because of other things to do. And whilst I appreciate you getting me home seven hours later, <clears> that, that's, not, that's not the experience that I paid for. That's not the contract I entered into. So Qantas has fallen foul of that where I think something like, is it 10,000 seats? 8,000. 8,000 seats um, have been sold on flights that were already cancelled. And that compounds then the problem that the company has had with... Um, it's flight credits to say, look, you're not flying, it's okay, we're gonna give you a flight credit. And then people haven't been able to redeem them and they've been subject to a class action uh, from a group of passengers that have sued them. And now, of course, the ACCC uh, is now pursuing them. And those damages, I think were stated in the AGM, or we've got to 250, $300 million set aside for that. So it's quite substantial. But that doesn't include Jetstar, which is a subsidiary of Qantas, and it doesn't include Qantas International. It's over 500 million when you actually add those numbers together. It's so big even, number. even when they're in the confession booth saying, oh, yeah, we know this and this is what the number, it's been portrayed in a way that perhaps isn't a, a, a full and wholesome picture of the entire or entirety of the problem the company's got. So again, if you talk about trust and rebuilding a brand, there's probably not ideal way to really go into it. So, you know, that's 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 a massive issue. And then I was going to say one last thing, AB, in terms of pub test, and this one has gathered a lot of attention recently, is ESG. So that's mm. environmental, social, and then yeah. governance. Qantas scores medium risk, and mm. I think they're about middle of the pack towards the lower end in industry standards. Yeah, look, it's a difficult one because environmental, social, and governance like is an airline. And so they are a big emitter of carbon. So That's right. you've got to look at through the lens that this is a, in an industry which is, which is a, a very heavy emitter of carbon. And so when you actually look at it within its peer group of airlines around the world, it's still just under the halfway point in that group. Of Middle airlines. of the road, yeah. So it's not at the top of the pile, which is probably where it would like to be seen. Uh, it's below average in that area when compared to other airlines. And I think, you know, to, to an extent, you know, it's been... How can I put it this? ranks 288th out of 389 to give you some perspective on this. Yeah, which is well below average. Well below. In that um, yeah. So, you know, it doesn't score brilliantly there. And you, and you look at 
you know, some of the some of the the, the, the the social governance issues if we move environment to the side for a moment. And one of the things I guess that it's that's become plagued with from a governance issue is its association uh, with the Labour government here in Australia right now, where there's speculation that Qatar Airlines were 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 closed out of Australia or they weren't granted more slots by the government. Uh, and it's been interesting to see how that particular uh, hand of cards has played out because initially the Prime Minister Stonewater said not my decision it was with the Transport Minister and now it's gradually emerged that well actually yeah we were aware of this as a government level before it was announced commercially so they were across what went on and then when you put that alongside the Prime Minister's son being granted access to the Chairman's Lounge I spent millions of dollars with Qantas I've got no chance of getting in the Chairman's Lounge yet someone that's a new graduate from university that's currently doing a work experience with Price Waterhouse um, gets granted access to the Chairman's Lounge and that's someone that's not a, a, an exposed person politically it's not someone anyone would recognise because I don't know what his son looks like any more than the next person does maybe we could look at his Facebook profile but the reality is how is that person being granted access to the absolute top tier echelon of the Chairman's Lounge which if captains of industry leaders of our nation and so on and then you look at the optics on this and go well yeah hang on a minute the, the government have squashed any competition coming in and this is particularly relevant when you look at um, the portrayal of airfares right now. Uh, again, you know, talk about failing the pub test. So you've got a, a, an outgoing CEO in the form of Alan Joyce saying airfares are pretty competitive and relatively cheap right now. And then this week, Webjet, which is a, a terrific online provider, you can click and pay and see what's happening and book airfares very easily. Um, came out and said, no, actually, airfares are about 65% more expensive uh, than they have been historically. So that's far cry from, um, you know, airfares are relatively competitive. But I can attest to that personally. You know, if I, I used to go to LA regularly, your business class seat, Brisbane to LA, six to $8,000 would be the support and resistance level, the price points for that. Sure. Cheap day, six grand, more expensive, maybe eight grand. And they've been stubbornly sitting at about $13,000 now uh, for, for a year and a half. Uh, since the end of the pandemic and, and it's interesting um, that that's defined as being competitive and cheap whereas if you had more excess slots coming into Australia another group of stakeholders being very specifically your customers would benefit from lower airfares and maybe that's a contrast to uh, the profitability of the business but stakeholders all deserve to be listened to, not just simply a focus on the bottom line. And as we've, I guess, articulated in quite some detail through this conversation, the desire to drive bottom line profitability at the expense of renewing your fleet, at the expense of customer service, at the expense of brand reputation, are very, very big prices to pay. And you forget last quarter's results but you don't forget the bad taste that being sold a flight that doesn't exist and you've got no ability to access your flight credit really leaves in your mouth. And these are long-term issues that the company is going to face. And so Richard Goyder has a huge job ahead of him. As I say, I couldn't think of a finer executive in Australia to be heading that challenge up. And I'm sure he'll unpack that puzzle and start that rebuilding process. But I guess from a pub test perspective, what leaves the worst taste in most people's mouths would be the fact that here's a business that hasn't renewed its fleet, has taken 2.7 billion in taxpayer money and not offered to pay a cracker back. They didn't have to, but they could have improved the optic by paying, even if it was 100 million back, it would go a long way. That has done the wrong thing by its customers, has arguably a questionable relationship with the current government has been involved with you know, significant virtue signalling and in getting involved in political matters. So, for example, with the voice referendum in Australia, Qantas somehow is elected to write the yes uh, word on the fuselage of three of its aircraft. It's, a, it's an ASX-listed business. It's supposed to be agnostic. It's not supposed to be pushing a political agenda. And that kind of virtue signalling perhaps needs to stop as does someone that gets paid $120 million for delivering a market return, a return that's less than what the ASX has done at the expense of leaving arguably some unpleasant, untidy and long-term wreckage and damage on the runway for the successors that are going to come through and have to clear it up. So from a, from a technical perspective, 
the chart's been appalling. It's Fail. not performed the market. If you look at it from a ratios perspective, oh yeah, the debt's down, that's great, at the expense of now flying around in the skies with a fleet that's almost 15 years old, which is almost triple the age of the fleet of the competitor that you shut out of the market. And perhaps most importantly, on an ESG score perspective in today's world, despite its virtue signaling, sits well below halfway amongst its peers of international airlines. That doesn't pass the pub test, Mitch, not for me, and I'm sure not for any of our listeners today. Couldn't agree more, AB, and I think our listeners now, me included, know everything we need to know about Qantas, and you know that level of analysis is, is very, very useful. Stock analysis, as we can see here, goes well beyond what the eye can see. So thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it, and you know it's not about jumping on 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 a on a on a soapbox and downloading on it because I, again I can't speak highly enough of the frontline staff at Qantas. They do an incredible job and spend a lot of time with them. Uh, to, to be able to say that, so it's not a one-off observation. And this kind of analysis, I guess we can do a deep dive on a variety of companies uh, around this great country of ours, and indeed internationally, but this one's certainly very topical right now. And I think, you know, for the average Australian that's facing mortgage pain, we're dealing with a higher cost of living, and you can see why your cost of airfares are up because they've shut out compet- competition that could maybe have uh, made airfares a little bit cheaper, and that's something that affects everyday Aussies, as is the non-repayment of the subsidies that they were given during the pandemic when they're in a position where they could afford it and they could help a lot of people out. And, and that's the thing that really more than anything I stick, I think will stick in the craw of people that are listening to this. So that's our opinion on it right now. Interested in your comments and feedback below. Time to roll you back in, AB. Thanks very much. <laughs> Absolute pleasure. Anytime, Mitch. There you have it, guys. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe. Most importantly, hit the notification button and we'll look forward to hosting you next week.